everyone, Saqib Khan here from the Spanavision Bridge and Seismic School. I thought today I would talk to you about uh, something that's more related to design. I've presented a few videos before about uh, more, more analytical topics, but today I thought I'd pick something that's rather high level yet speaks to design a little bit more. So I'm going to talk to you about some potential vulnerabilities or deficiencies of a two column bridge bend when it's designed for seismic loads. So what I've drawn here is just a typical bridge bend with two columns and a cap beam. And I'm, I've drawn two spread footings, individual spread footings for each column. Of course you could have uh, soils that are not amenable to spread footings and then you would have pile foundations, but the overall thought process would remain the same. So what I've done here is that I have labeled and marked a few zones and I will speak to you about them individually. I want to talk to you about what sort of demands these regions see and from a design point of view what it is that we need to look out for. So it's more of a philosophical conversation at this point. I'm not going into any numbers but I want to make you aware of the sort of things that you need to be mindful of when you're designing something like this. Now, uh, you know, a bridge bend, uh, most of the times, if you're not shedding all the load to your abutments, is a primary load path element or a load path component uh, as part of your earthquake resisting system. <clears throat> so let's start. I want you to focus on uh, A. So there are four typical zones out here at the bottom and the top of the bend. And in here, I have just drawn these Mickey Mouse cartoons for the demands that these things will see under a seismic load. So as you can see, the bottom and the top of the column see the highest demands. And these indeed are the portions which we make purposefully weaker. These are the structural fuses. In a bridge bent, what we do is we make the columns weaker than everything else. So they cap the overall demand that can get into the system. This is in contrast to what we have in buildings. In bridges we have weak column, strong beam analogy, whereas in buildings we have strong column, weak beam analogy. There is a perfectly valid reason for that. If you do this in a building, say a multi-story building, the columns at the base of your building are going to hinge and they're going to have huge concentrations of plasticity and they'll have to undergo a lot of plastic deformation. So all your ductility is concentrated or the ductility demand is concentrated at the base of your building. So that turns your building into a weak story building which is not uh, a, the preferred way to design things because you can really run into trouble uh, as a result of those ductility concentrations. If you make your beams weaker in a building, now you can spread that plasticity up and down. Then you can design the building properly for seismic loads because now the plasticity is spread out and the individual ductility demands are not going to be too high. In bridges we do not want our sole cap beam to hinge because you've got the deck setting on top of this and if you hinge on both sides uh, you'll pretty much turn this thing into a mechanism and there are chances that you can have failure in, because you will overload the system. Okay, so the regions A are the typical plastic hen zones. Uh, what we want to do is have appropriate amount of longitudinal rebar so that we meet the stress and strain limits that are tied to the performance level. In S619, which is the current bridge code, the current highway bridge code for Canada, we have to design for different performance levels when we're doing performance space design and those are tied to different return period events uh, for earthquakes. So for example for a critical or lifeline bridge you may not be allowed to have much plasticity in here. You may be allowed to have a little bit of little bit of yielding in your rebar but not a lot. The strain limits are pretty stringent. <clears throat> so in that case uh, you want to have enough rebar, but you don't want to have too much because as you make your system stronger, the overstrength forces are going to be large and all the other areas like the cap beam and the foundations and the column zones outside of the plastic hinge zones that need to be capacity protected will become very difficult to manage. Okay, so we want to have appropriate amount of longitudinal rebar, 
we want to have appropriate confinement reinforcement and we also want to have enough shear reinforcement for overstrength shear that can develop as a result of any overstrength in the system. Looking at B, this is the column zone outside of the plastic hinges. The significant thing here is that you can have what we call plastic hinge migration if the plastic hinge zones are not detailed appropriately. Uh, you have some rebar coming out, your demands are dropping, and people in the past have tended to curtail that reinforcement very quickly. But if you focus on this zone here, the demand outside of the plastic hinge zone is still pretty high or could be pretty high and there is a pretty high gradient here so you do not want to curtail your reinforcement too early because in that case you won't form the hinge within the plastic hinge zone but actually higher than that and in all probability you will not have detailed this to deal with any kind of plastic hinging so that's very important to be mindful of that we also want to make sure that we have enough shear reinforcement through here uh, as compared to the overstrength shear that's going to be generated within the column. I want to then talk about zones C and E. So C is the typical column footing joint and E is the typical column cap beam joint. And the joints are very, very important when it comes to transferring loads between beams and columns, they're, they're critical. What we do not want to have happen is extensive cracking as a result of high principal stresses within these zones. So we have to size them appropriately. The sizes have to be large enough so that we do not get very high stress values. We, can, we control the principal tensile and principal compressive stresses in almost all cases when the system is pushed to the limit under a high earthquake we will see some cracking again we want to control it but to have these behave properly and not uh, form pins or hinges within within themselves what we want to have is appropriate confinement reinforcement through here so two things for joints size them appropriately and then we need to also provide appropriate joint confinement reinforcement so that principal stresses and joint shear are appropriately designed for and dealt with. Let's talk about por the, the portions D and G. So D is your typical spread footing. Uh, that, where that comes into play is that again we want to have the hinges within the column we do not want the joint or the footing itself to be weaker than the column because then you can have flexural failure or shear failure of the footing. We do not want that. We want the plastic hinging or the deformation or the damage to occur within the column and not have it penetrate into the footing or the footing joint. Then let's think about F. It's the same philosophy. We do not want the demands in the cab beam to be so high that we do not have appropriate capacities. We do not want plastic hinging happening within the cab beam or having shear failure. That's the worst type of failure. It's going to be brittle. It's not going to give you much warning. We want to avoid all of those. If we look at the demand envelope, and I've only drawn it assuming that the shear is moving this way. What happens in an earthquake is that it is going to reverse. Uh, the seismic load goes back and forth, back and forth. So in that case, this thing is going to reverse and it's going to turn into something like this. A typical mistake that designers in the past have made is to not provide appropriate positive reinforcement in these end zones because under gravitational loads, you really see negative bending over these zones. But when you have an earthquake happening, it is very likely to overcome the negative bending, say on this side, when it is being pushed to the other side, and therefore go into positive bending. So if you look at your typical bends from the 60s and 70s, they've had very little to no rebar. The rebar was always sort of in the middle here and not taken back. Or there is some rebar which goes slightly into the joint, but it's not developed. So we want to avoid that sort of detailing. The other thing as you can see is when I'm pushing it this way, 
this negative bending is now in addition to the bending that you would get from live loads or other gravity type loading and so if we ignore that then you could also have negative failure so the appropriate way is to detail this thing such that there is appropriate positive rebar and there is appropriate negative rebar okay so we have to be mindful of all of these things now just to wrap it up what we want to make sure is that the plastic hinges have appropriate amount of longitudinal reinforcement and that we're keeping the hinging within the, pla the desired plastic hinge zones we want to make sure there is enough shear and confinement reinforcement we want to make sure that our column and footing joint zones and the column cap joint zones are properly sized and they have proper anchorage of the reinforcement into them plus they have their own confinement reinforcement outside of the plastic hen zones we want to make sure that the columns uh, do not have overly aggressive rebar curtailment we have to think about and look at the the demand envelopes we have to think about what we call tension shift effects when the plastic hinge forms and make sure that we do not curtail rebar unnecessarily and too quickly because then we can have plastic hinge migration we also want to have proper shear reinforcement within these zones so that overstrength shear can be taken care of and you will make you want to make sure that you don't have the uh, shear failure in that scenario we also want to make sure that our soil is appropriate uh, the rock or soil should not fail we should not have bearing failure of the soil or um, lifting of the footing etc or the sliding of the footing we want to make sure that those failure mechanisms are suppressed when the system is subjected to the overstrength shear demands so I hope that this was somewhat helpful when you're trying to design your next bend keep these overarching principles in mind and you will get a rather resilient earthquake resisting system which will make sure that we meet the performance goals. Thank you very much for staying with me and I will speak to you soon. Thank you.